Hi, welcome to lecture number five, covering chapter five of Focus on Personal Finance. This chapter covers consumer credit, its advantages, its disadvantages, sources, and costs. Chances are, if you have not already borrowed money, at some point in your life you will. Matter of fact, probably at lots of points in your life you will. But using credit inappropriately can cause your financial run. So it's imperative that you understand the advantages and disadvantages of using consumer credit so that you can make wise, make wise choices that support your personal financial goals, the ones we keep talking about over and over, those personal financial goals in your overall plan. So let's see what this chapter holds for us. This chapter defines consumer credit and it's going to give us tools to analyze advantages and disadvantages. The importance of consumer credit in our economy is explained, and its uses and misuses of credit will be discussed. Financial and personal opportunity cost of using credit are emphasized. The two types of consumer credit that we'll look at are closed-end credit and open-end credit. We're going to look at the general rules of measuring credit capacity, such as debt payments to income ratio and debt to equity ratios. And this will be followed by the coverage of building and maintaining a good credit rating. In determining the cost of credit, we emphasize the finance charge and the APR or the annual percentage rate. Then we're going to show how the cost of credit can be determined by calculating interest with various interest formulas. We're going to outline the steps in avoiding and correcting credit mistakes. That'll be valuable information. And finally, we will explain the difference between uh, Chapter 7 bankruptcy and Chapter 13 bankruptcy. So we have lots of things to cover tonight, so let's get started. Tonight we have five learning objectives, and our first one is to analyze advantages and disadvantages of using consumer credit. So consumer credit is the use of credit by individuals for our personal needs. Among the advantages of using credit are purchasing goods when they're needed and paying for them gradually, or perhaps you might have a financial emergency. Sometimes we just want to do some convenience shopping and of course, there's always the need to establish a credit rating so that you can borrow later in life for those important things like maybe a car or home purchase. But credit costs money, encourages overspending, and ties up income for the future. So we need to look at both the advantages and the disadvantages. Objective number two, we want to assess the types and sources of consumer credit. So we'll look at closed-end credit and open-end credit. We'll look at the major sources of consumer credit, like commercial banks, savings and loans. We'll talk about credit unions, finance companies, life insurance companies, family and friends, using them uh, for, for loans. And each of these sources has advantages and disadvantages, and we'll look at those as well. Objective number three is to determine whether you can afford a loan and how to apply for that credit. So two general rules of thumb for measuring credit capacity are the debt payments to income ratio and the debt to equity ratio, and we're gonna look at those. In reviewing your credit worthiness, a creditor seeks information from one of the three national credit bureaus, and we're going to talk about that as well. Objective number four is to determine the cost of credit by calculating interest using various interest formulas. So we're going to compare the finance charge and the APR because that will help you as you shop for credit. Objective number five, develop a plan to protect your credit rating and manage your debts. Um, if billing errors occur on your account, you have things that you can do such as notifying a creditor within 60 days and then if the dispute is not settled in your favor, you can place your version of what's happened in your credit file so that that information is there as others pull your credit uh, report for future times that you want to uh, borrow money. If you have a complaint about credit, 
you need to first try to deal directly with the creditor, but if that fails, you can turn to the appropriate credit, um, consumer credit law to help you. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So let's get moving here. Learning objective number one, analyze advantages and disadvantages of using consumer credit. So what is credit? Credit is an arrangement to receive cash goods or services now and pay for them in the future. Consumer credit is the use of credit for personal needs of individuals and families. It's a major force in our economy. If you use credit, you want to make sure you have a valid reason, such as a medical emergency or an immediate need for a car. Um, if you need to buy something now to protect against rising prices for something that you know you're going to need in the near future. But you also have to consider the trade-offs before you make the decision. Do you have cash to make the purchase? Or would you want to use dollars from your savings? Does the purchase fit into your budget? Could you postpone the purchase? Effective use of credit can help, help us satisfy our wants and our needs, but misused credit can result in lots of problems, such as defaulting on the loan, bankruptcy, and your loss of your personal uh, credit reputation. But of course, there are advantages of using credit. You can buy now and enjoy it now and pay for it from future income earnings. Um, you can purchase goods even when your funds are low. It's easier to return merchandise when you buy on credit because you will have a receipt record. It's a sh shopping convenience. There's no need to carry large amounts of cash. Simplified bookkeeping of your expenses because you get a statement at the end of the month if you're putting it on a credit card. Sometimes there are rebates offers on purchases and you would be able to take care take advantage of that if you uh, purchase on credit. And then there's that all motivating cash bonus based on the total purchases during the year, which many credit cards have at this point. But you still need to weigh the advantages against the disadvantages. So let's look at some of the disadvantages. No matter what, credit costs money. You're going to have to pay somebody something for using their money until you can pay it back. Sometimes credit costs, causes overspending because it's too readily available to us and we make purchases that we didn't plan for. Credit ties up future income. That doesn't allow you to make to use the uh, future income for things that you want to buy in the future nor does it help you to save for the future. So an intelligent decision to use credit demands careful evaluation of what uh, your current debt situation is, what you plan to have for future income, and you need to realistically estimate that. What are the added costs of using credit? And are there consequences to you for overspending? And you need to ask yourself that before you make purchases on credit. So before we can make a decision to use credit, we need to know the types and sources of consumer credit that are available to us, which happens to be our learning objective number two. So there are two different types of credit. There is closed end credit and open end credit. So closed end credit is a, a one-time loan for a specific purchase for a specific amount, and it's paid back in set periods of time. So um, maybe for a car purchase, that would be a good example. Um, you borrow a certain amount, let's say you purchased a used car for $5,000, you have a monthly payment of uh, $200 for or four years, and I don't know if that works out or not, I'm just using this as an example. So you're, you have a set amount that you're paying back set intervals for in a set uh, period of time. Where open-ended credit is to be used as needed until the line of credit max is reached. So you may have like a line of credit with your credit union and if that amount is $5,000 you don't necessarily need to take out the entire $5,000. You could have a need come up where you need $500 and so you borrow $500 and then you have a set amount that you have to pay back each month but then you have gone two or three months and you have another crisis and you need a little bit more money so you go back in and you take out a thousand and now you owe the balance of the $500 that you haven't paid back yet, plus another thousand, that amount of 
payment each month increases how much they want back from you, but you still have $3,500 available to you that you could use should you still need that. So that amount fluctuates up and down based on how much you're paying back and how much you're borrowing, but it's not a set amount each month. For a quick review, close-end credit would be like your mortgage, your automobile, an installment loan for furniture, a washer dryer, those types of things. While your open-ended credit would be things like your credit card, a department store credit card, a home equity um, loan, a line of credit from a bank, which I used as the example a second ago, those types of things. And then there is credit cards. What an invention a credit card was. Consumers using credit cards has actually changed how America used credit. And not necessarily for the better because though it's certainly very easy to use and much more convenient than using cash, it can also cause us to overspend and lose control of, uh, of what we have out there, what we've charged. I was really surprised to see this, but the book is telling us that the average cardholder has more than nine credit cards in their wallet. That is amazing to me. Credit cards can be an advantage if we appropriately manage them. So if you pay off your balance each month, then you're called a convenience user. And if you don't pay off your balance each month, you are known as a borrower. And that is because, in a sense, you are ending up borrowing money and paying interest for the opportunity to use that vendor's money until you get it paid back. And I know we talked about this a little bit last week, but don't confuse a credit card with a debit card. A debit card actually debits your checking account at the moment that you purchase the good or the service, while a credit card is actually extending you credit and delaying your payments. What are some of the sources of consumer credit? The source of credit comes in all shapes and sizes. They play an important role in our economy and they offer a broad range of financial services. So let's look at some of the financial institutions that offer credit. So a loan is when you borrow money with an agreement to repay that amount of the loan back with interest over a certain period of time. Now the book talks about inexpensive, medium price, and expensive loans, and I think it's interesting that they list expensive or inexpensive loans as parents or family members. Uh, you can borrow money from your parents or family members, but you do need to be careful about borrowing money because even though borrowing money from family or friends may be the least expensive loan source, it can also complicate your family or your friend relationships, especially if you are in a situation where you're not able to pay them back as timely as you had hoped. So be careful when considering borrowing money from family and friends uh, and make sure that you think that through completely, including what would happen to your relationship if you were not able to repay the loan as you had agreed to initially. So medium price loans can be found at commercial banks savings and loan associations, and credit unions. Our more expensive loans are available through finance companies and retailers and banks through credit cards because finance companies often lend money to people who cannot obtain credit from a medium priced uh, loan institution such as a bank or a credit union. They charge higher interest rates and interest rates can range in place from 12 to 25 percent. So um, that's really incredibly high. So you need to be aware of what percentage rate that you're paying on the money that you borrow. Home equity loans for just a second. If you own a home and you have earned equity in your home, you may be able to take out a home equity loan. Home equity loans are usually used for major items such as um, a, home, a major home improvement or uh, education expenses or medical bills that were unplanned for. Interest paid on a home equity loan is tax deductible. But the things that I will caution you about is that first of all, you have to have equity in your home and normally, uh, depending on the, the, the financial institution, they often will only loan you the difference between 
um, what you owe on your home and 80% of its value. So if you say, if you own, and I know it's not practical to own a home for $100,000 here, but let's just use that for a simple example. You own a home that's valued at $100,000 and you owe $70,000 on it, then they will only loan you $10,000 on your home because they're gonna lo loan you the difference between what you owe and 80% of the home value. And on a $100,000 house, that would be $80,000. So uh, home equity loans, though often used for major purchases, education, and medical expenses, um, you have to be in a position where you have equity in your home to be able to do that. The other thing I will caution you about is that because you've used your home as collateral for that loan, you have to pay that back before you can sell your home. So you have a $100,000 house and you have purchased, have taken out a home equity loan of $10,000. You've got to pay that off at the time that you sell the house in order to make that sale. So it's not a loan that you can roll forward and pay back at a different time. It's got to be paid back at the time of the home sell if you haven't already paid it back. So to learning objective number three, determine whether you can afford a loan and how to apply for credit. The only way to determine how much credit you can assume is to first learn how to make an accurate and sensible personal or family budget, which we talked about in chapter one. Before you take out a loan, ask yourself whether you can meet all of your essential expenses that are already in your budget, and can you still add the cost of a monthly loan payment? Will your budget still be balanced? That alone will cause your family budget to no longer be balanced. Then the question is, what's in your current budget that you can give up so that you can take out the loan and continue to have a balanced budget? Precisely measuring your credit capacity can be difficult, but you can do it if you follow a certain few rules of thumb. So let's begin by looking at the debt payment to income ratio and how to, and how to figure that. So your consumer credit payment should not exceed more than 20% of your net income. So to calculate your debt payments to income ratio, you will divide your monthly debt payments and this does not include your house payment, but all other payments by your net monthly income. When you do that, if the number that you get is greater than 20%, then your debt payment to income ratio is too high, and you need to consider what you can do to lower uh, your credit um, debt capacity. A credit capacity is your debt to equity your debt to equity ratio. And the number you are looking for here should be less than one. And once again, you are excluding your home value because that's a long-term debt. So your debt to equity ratio is calculated by dividing your total liabilities by your net worth. If your debt to equity ratio is about one, that is about the outer limits of what um, you probably you probably reach the upper limits of your debt obligations. You want to keep that under one. Whenever a lender looks at you and is trying to assess whether or not you will be a good risk to make a loan to, what do they look at? Well, there are five C's of credit: character, capacity, capital, collateral, and conditions. Sure. Will you repay the loan? Uh, capacity, can you repay the loan? Capital, what are your assets and your net worth? So what if you don't repay the loan? What do you have that can help us to get our money back or the value of our money back? And conditions, is your job secure? Are you in a position or a, in a, um, a market, job market that's uh, volatile? Um, have there been downsizings in the market where you've been? How secure is your job? How long have you been there? also going to look at your credit report. Matter of fact, lenders rely pretty heavily on what's on your credit report. So your credit report is a complete credit history that notes any time that you've borrowed money, how well that you've paid that money back, if you've been late on your payments. Um, there are three major credit bureaus. There's Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. 
these three companies maintain uh, more than 200 million credit files on individuals. And the credit bureaus obtain their information from banks, finance companies, stores, credit card companies, and other lenders. So in addition to whether or not you've paid timely, missed a payment, um, been late and by how much that you were late or did you make up the payment, your credit file also has all of your personal information, whether you're a homeowner or a renter, and it even has information as to whether or not you've had checks returned for insufficient funds. The Fair Credit Reporting Act uh, works to uh, protect you. It regulates the use of credit, uh, I'm sorry, credit reports, and it requires the deletion of obsolete information. It also gives you, the consumer, access to your file and the right to have erroneous data corrected. And if you file a complaint and they won't correct it, you have the right to notate uh, in 100 words or less um, what your side of the story is on that so that that's there for whenever creditors pull your credit report. So who can obtain a credit report? Only people that you've authorized to have access to your credit report uh, and that they have to have a legitimate business purpose for doing so can have access to your credit. So um, like I couldn't just pull the credit report on you because I don't have a legitimate business reason to do that, nor do I have your permission. It's also uh, worth noting that there are time limits on how long unfavorable data can be on your, or in your um, credit report. And for most information, it's for seven years. Uh, bankruptcies can be reported for up to 10 years. And with, as with any rule, there's always an exception. So the exception to that would be if you are applying for a large amount of credit exceeding $75,000 or for a large amount of life insurance exceeding $150,000. The information that's in your credit report is measured by what is called a FICO credit score. Credit scores range from 350 to 850, which is pretty much a perfect score. The higher the score means the less risk that you are to a lender. You can get your FICA score at www.myfico.com uh, for free if you want to see what your score is. Because there has been some controversy as to whether or not the FICA score um, is relevant, the three credit companies have gotten together and created a new scoring system which is called Vantage Score. With Vantage Score, your range of score is 501 to 990. It does talk about the Vantage Score. I would have to say that I, I haven't had that come up yet in like when we purchased our home or uh, other times that we've purchased, that we've borrowed money. Uh, not that it won't in the near future, but it hasn't as of yet. And I think the FICO score is the more commonly used score. So let's take a minute and look at what makes up your FICO score. And you can find this chart in your book on page 155. But as these uh, credit uh, bureaus rate you, they're giving you scores and 35% of your score is based on your payment history and 30% is based on the amounts owed. 10% are on the types of credits that you have out, 10% uh, is on new credit, and then 15% is on the length of your credit history. So on the length, the longer that you use credit successfully and you're paying it back, that's adding to your score and building it. Um, you want, of course, to be timely. That's going to give you a higher score on your payment history, which they give you a lot of, um, and that's 35%, so that's pretty heavily weighted. The other thing I would call to your attention is uh, the 10% that goes to new credit, because I was surprised to find this out. Um, a few years ago, there was a real push to give you a discount if you open up this store credit card and this store credit card and this store credit card. And so you get you know 20% off whenever I'm buying that new blouse and 20% off when I'm buying those boots. So I actually opened several of those credit cards uh, within like a year's period and then, of course, I didn't really use the credit card again, but I wanted the discount. But just because I had opened all of those different uh, credit cards, it dropped my credit score because I had um, lots of new credit. And that was um, 
that was showing me and pushing me up into a higher risk category, I'm sure, because they were wondering why is she taking out all of these new credit cards. So we also had a credit card one time that uh, was given to us by a company that we used, but they gave us a really high credit line, and we asked for that to be reduced once again because they want to look at the types of credit that's available to you, and if you have a lot of money available to you that you can take out, then that puts you at a higher risk because you could always um, utilize that. So let's say you have a $20,000 max on a credit card. That means you could charge $20,000. And then the question is, do you have the ability to pay that back timely? And if not, then that pushes you up um, into a higher risk bracket, giving you a lower FICO score and making you less attractive to, uh, to lenders. Another act that protects you as a borrower is the ECOA, or Equal Credit Opportunity Act. It does guarantee that all applicants have the same rights and that creditors may not discriminate against you based on your age, your sex, whether or not you're married, whether or not you're getting uh, public assistance or drawing Social Security of any kind, uh, and what race or nationality that you might be. This act also provides that you can know the reasons that you were denied for credit. So if you are denied for credit, you have the right to know that and to get a copy of the credit report that they used to deny you within 60 days, but you do have to request that. Useful chart in your book on page 159 on what to do if you're denied credit, and I won't take the time here to go through this, but I would uh, refer to you, you to the book to review this chart uh, if you've been denied credit so that you can see what steps that you can take. Learning objective number four. Uh, determine the cost of credit by calculating interest using various interest formulas. So the finance charge is the total amount, a dollar amount that you use, that you, let me try this again. Your finance charge is the total dollar amount that you pay to use credit. In addition to what you're paying out for interest, it also includes fees, um, service charges, if there's credit related insurance or appraisal fees, that's all considered in part of your, of your finance charge. Where your APR, or your annual percentage rate, is actually the percentage cost of credit on an annual basis. So this is what you want to know when you're doing shopping. You want to know what the APR is so that you're comparing apples to apples. When you choose your financing, there are trade-offs between the features that you prefer and the cost that's going to uh, add to your loan. So there are some major trade-offs that you can, you should consider. So the first is the length of the loan, or the term versus the interest costs. The longer the term for a loan at a given interest rate, the greater the amount that must be paid in interest charges. So if you look at borrowing money for a car, let's use our $5,000 uh, used vehicle, and if you borrow that over a four-year period, your uh, interest is going to be uh, less, of course, than if you borrow that money over a six-year period. So even though choosing a longer loan of six years is going to make your car payment less, you're going to pay out significantly more in interest charges. So you need to do the math and compare and make sure that you uh, are making good choices based on what your current financial needs are. And the second item is the lender risk versus interest rates, meaning that the greater a risk you are to a lender, the higher the cost of credit. So I know that um, uh, the child that I shared with you the other day about um, having issues with uh, taking out the $500 um, payday loan type thing and then ended up owing $5,000 in a matter of just uh, about six to eight weeks. So then that impacted her credit negatively. So whenever she went to purchase a car, she was shocked to find out that the difference on her used car purchase and in interest um, was going to be um, like, it, it was like 14%, which was incredibly high because she appeared to be a poor credit risk. And then we found out that if we would co-sign for the loan, she could get an interest rate of 2%. So. Um, we did co-sign for the loan, and we'll talk about that in a later, uh, later lesson. Um, I would suggest that you 
strongly consider whether or not you want to take that risk. Um, but anyway, the point of, of telling you the story at this point is that the, the lower your credit score, the higher you are as a risk to the lender, therefore the higher the cost of credit is going to be to you too. If you keep that score high, then you can uh, borrow money at, at a lesser interest rate than a peer who is a high risk. Other ways to get a lower interest rate is to put up collateral or to secure the loan. So let's say that you own that $5,000 car and you want to open, uh, you need a loan. And so if you can secure that loan by saying, I'll put up the title of the car against that loan, you can usually get a lower interest rate because if you don't pay the loan, then they'll take that car. Uh, if you provide upfront cash, that would lower the amount that you would be borrowing, which would sometimes lower the amount of your interest rate. Um, the shorter term the loan, the less you're going to pay on interest. And the last one is to accept a variable interest rate. And that would mean that your interest rate is going to fluctuate based on the market. Uh, and though you can sometimes get initially a lower interest rate, you have to be really careful because there's a reason they're offering that. And oftentimes that's because it's going to really be higher. It's going to go up quickly and be higher interest rate as time goes on. So if you don't pay that off quickly, then you end up paying an even higher interest rate than if you would have just taken a, a fixed interest rate to begin with. So I'm not a fan of the variable interest rate. So what is that interest that you're paying anyway? Let's do some simple calculations on the cost of credit. The first calculation that we'll do is on simple interest. Simple interest is the interest computed on principal only and without compounding. So it's the dollar cost of borrowing money. And the formula for that is interest equals principal times the rate of interest that you're paying times the amount of time that you're paying that. Then there is simple interest on the declining balance. When more than one payment is made on a simple interest loan, the method of computing interest is known as the declining balance method. So you are only paying interest on the amount of the original loan that's not yet been repaid. And finally, there's the add-on interest. And when this method is used, interest is calculated on the full amount of the original principal. How frequently you make payments, your interest is calculated on the full amount of the original principal. So the longer that you take to repay the loan, the more interest you'll pay. Learning objective number five, develop a plan to protect your credit and manage your debts. So the Fair Credit Billing Act, which was formed in 1975, sets a procedure for promptly correcting billing errors, for refusing to make credit card or revolving credit payments on defective goods that you've purchased, or for promptly crediting your payments. If you think that the bill that you received is wrong or you want more information about it, you can notify your creditor in writing. You need to pay all of the other parts of your bill that are not in dispute and the creditor must acknowledge your letter within 30 days. Then the credit card company must respond to uh, your letter within 90 days. Most usually, and the time that this is being disputed, they kind of like take it off of your bill and put it like in suspension until they can figure out whether or not it's a, an expense that you should pay. But be sure and pay all of the other charges on your credit card. Don't just say, well, this one thing is wrong, so I'm not paying any of it. You need to pay everything but the disputed, uh, this disputed charge. And the item that you're disputing can't affect your credit rating. And until your complaint has been answered, your creditor can't take any action to try to collect the disputed amount. Today's um, environment, the concern over having your identity stolen is pretty high. I know I, I worry about that. I worry about trying to protect myself against um, stolen identity, especially with uh, what happened recently with Equifax. If for any reason you suspect that your identity has been stolen, the first thing you need to do is to contact all three of the major credit bureaus. If the situation is that an account has been opened in your name that you did not authorize, you need to immediately contact that, uh, that company, that creditor, and let them know that that wasn't you that opened that 
charge account, and then you need to file a police report and keep a copy of it. My son actually had this happen uh, just last week. Uh, he had someone who had a social security number and his information, and they um, opened a, a rather large charge account in his name. And whenever he was notified of it, then uh, he filed the police report and went through the steps. And he said he was able to stop it, but he said it's immensely uh, time consuming. Though it seems like the number one uh, way that it did today that we're getting our information uh, for identity theft is through uh, computer breaches. There are other things that we can do to help to prevent against um, uh, our identity theft. And one is to shred any papers that contain personal information. If you don't have a shredder, just be sure and really tear up any information that you throw away that has any uh, personal information. If you have um, an account that you think that an identity theft may have happened against, you need to immediately close that account. Whenever you give your credit card to someone for a purchase, you need to make sure that you're getting that card back. You need to keep a record of all your credit cards and you can either like write those down someplace along uh, with the date that they expire and the telephone number of who you need to call if that card is lost or stolen. Um, or the other thing that you can do is just simply take a picture on your phone of the front and back of each one of your cards to make sure it's legible and you can read it so that you have that information in case a card is ever stolen and then immediately notify your credit card company so that you can uh, stop any personal liability for the use of that card. There are things you can do on the internet when you're using the internet for purchases to protect yourself. I have, uh, I use the online purchasing quite a bit and I have actually had uh, my credit card number stolen more than once, unfortunately. Uh, some things that you can do to keep that from happening is to make sure you're on a secure browser Keep a record of all of your transactions, whether online or not, and each month whenever you get your credit card statement, you need to go through and check every single one of those off, even if it's a small amount, because sometimes when they get your number, they make a small purchase to see if you notice it, and if you don't, then they'll use your card again, or they could be hitting your uh, credit card with a small amount each month, and you just don't notice it, and it's on there for a long period of time, and over a period of time, that adds up. If you're not checking those things, um, you know, it's slipping right by you and you never, you never know it. And keep your personal information private. Of course, never give out uh, a password to anyone and don't open files sent to you by strangers. And this is our slide on co-signing a loan, which we've already told you a little bit about. Um, so what happened with that loan is that I was not aware when payments were being made or not made timely. And obviously this child of mine is having some problems managing their finance effectively and they fell behind on a couple of the payments. Because we had moved, we were not notified by the bank in a timely manner that this person was behind on their loan payments. And so uh, by the time that we found that out, then we would call her and say, you need to get this paid or, you know, there's going to be trouble for you in the future and because uh, there's nothing we can do. We've already signed the loan, and then by the time she made the payment, she was late. And surprisingly, that showed up on our credit report whenever we went to buy our house. So my advice to you on co-signing a loan is that if you cannot afford or you do not want to actually be responsible for that loan and be responsible for repaying that loan, you should think twice about co-signing because co-signing equals signing for the loan. You are just as much responsible in your uh, credit reports will reflect the information if the person you co-sign for does not hold up their end of the bargain and make their payments timely. You know, if you are taking on the characteristics of my daughter who does not manage her money well, well, there are signs that we can look at. If you are having uh, trouble paying the minimum balance that's due on each of your notes, if you are only making that minimum balance due on your credit card each month, these are signs that you could be headed towards uh, financial trouble. If the total balance on your credit card increases every month and you're not getting that balance paid down, if you are missing payments or if you are paying late, if you're having to withdraw money from savings to pay for things that are on your budget, 
if you are getting second and third uh, late payment notices before you're actually able to pay a bill. If you are borrowing money to add to old debts, and I think that's a really important one. If you are, have old debt and you're having to borrow money to pay for other debts, so you're creating new debts to pay for old debt, that's a big red flag. If you're exceeding the credit limits on your credit cards, that's a big red flag. And if you have had credit denied to you based on a bad credit report, that's a huge flag that you are out of control and need to look at how to better manage your debt. It's also worth noting here that if for any reason you can't make a payment, rather than just missing it or being late, the best thing you can do is to contact your creditor and let them know what's going on. Uh, even just the fact that you called, sometimes they'll work with you, sometimes they won't, but the very fact that you called will go a long way in, uh, in helping to overcome problems that you may have in the future. Excessive indebtedness uh, really wears on a person and sometimes manifests itself in things like uh, increased drinking, um, not paying attention to what's going on with your children or with your spouse, starting to have marital difficulties. Uh, drug abuse can be related to uh, the pressures of excessive de indebtedness. So these are some other signs that you're, you may be experiencing uh, fairly significant debt managing issues. And there are some things that you can do to help address those. So let's look at some help that's there for you. The uh, first, my first uh, place that I would send you, my first choice would be the Consumer Credit Counseling Services. It's um, a local not-for-profit organization. It's affiliated with the National Foundation for Consumer Credit and it provides debt counseling services for, uh, for individuals with serious financial problems. It can help them to help individuals who seek their services manage their money uh, through better education. They can also help you come up with a plan to help pay off uh, your expenses and help you to work with uh, creditors in consolidating debt and coming up with a debt reduction plan. In addition to consumer credit counseling services, you can also find oftentimes uh, services available through universities. Uh, a credit union, I've mentioned that before, they have lots of services and uh, they often have assistance to help you get a handle on plan, making a better plan for your finances and getting things under control. Uh, military bases often have resources for local county extension agencies debt that you have incurred gets to the point where it's not manageable, personal bankruptcy may be something you need to look at. There are two different types of uh, bankruptcy. There is a Chapter 7, which is just a straight bankruptcy, and Chapter 13, which uh, basically gives you an opportunity to reorganize or restructure. Bankruptcy should absolutely be the last resort because it will damage your credit rating. Um, it can also be a very stressful thing to go through. But sometimes when you have no other options, uh, this is something that, uh, that you might have to consider. So let's take a quick look at, at what is a Chapter 7 and what's a Chapter 13. For 7 bankruptcy, you make a list of all of your assets and all of your liabilities. And then you submit this to a court. And they decide um, which of your assets will be sold to pay creditors and which debts will be forgiven. You do get to keep some of your assets, such as your home or your vehicle. The intent is to wipe out all of your debt and to give you a fresh start. Um, most personal filings are a Chapter 7. So after filing a Chapter 7 bankruptcy, you will no longer owe uh, retail store charges or bank credit card charges, any unsecured loans or hospital or physician bills. However, it is notable that you may still owe any taxes and fines. Um, matter of fact, you probably will still owe. It does not wipe out PAC child support or alimony, any educational loans, um, or any debts uh, that have been assessed to you based on willful and malicious acts. A Chapter 13 bankruptcy is a little bit different. It's considered a reorganization bankruptcy, um, a debtor with regular income can propose to a bankruptcy court a plan for how to pay off the debts uh, from future earnings. 
13, you usually keep most or all of your, um, of your property. Then you make a payment to a court or an appointed trustee. And the advantage of this Chapter 13 bankruptcy is that it kind of like stops the madness. So let's say that you have 10 creditors and they're all assessing late fees and interest and um, and they're hounding you and hassling you and you're under all this pressure because you've got all these people trying to collect money and it's more money than you can pay out right now, but you feel like you could reorganize that debt, combine it, stop the madness of all of the late fees and such, and you can get caught up on your expenses and that's what uh, a Chapter 13 bankruptcy allows you to do. Before filing bankruptcy, you need to consider the other costs of filing bankruptcy, in addition to the fact that you'll have to pay a, a lawyer to represent you and they're going to want cash up front, uh, it can make obtaining credit more difficult. In more recent years, some creditors have uh, not considered it too heavily against you because you can't file bankruptcy again for eight years, so the chances are if you just filed bankruptcy, that you're going to have to pay your bills for now because you couldn't take them through a Chapter 7 uh, bankruptcy. And creditors have a tendency to look more favorably on Chapter 13 than Chapter 7 because Chapter 7 wipes out the debt, while Chapter 13 just allows you to reorganize so you can repay over uh, a greater period of time. I think that's all that I want to point out tonight over Chapter 5. Uh, just remember that the full deck of PowerPoint slides are available to you and are a great way for you to, uh, to study or to highlight in the chapter what you might want to uh, pay attention to. There are also some supplemental videos uh, attached to this chapter and um, it would be worth your time to just kind of look through those. I think that it'll uh, certainly enrich your learning and um, hopefully help you to grasp some of the concepts to a deeper level than what we were able to in just going through the PowerPoint tonight. If you need me, please contact me with the information that's on the syllabus, and I'll look forward to seeing you next week.